This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And where I am right now is the top of Golgotha. This is where Jesus was crucified. And over many centuries, churches built a platform on top of Golgotha Mountain. But directly behind me is the place where Jesus' cross was put into the earth. And in fact, you can even see parts of the ancient Golgotha under glass. It is still here. This is a real bona fide location. This is not just a fairy tale or something we read about in scripture that's interesting. It's a real historical location. Jesus was really crucified and he was crucified in this place. I know it doesn't look like that because it's now so highly decorated. There's a church built on top of it, but directly below this floor is what is left of Golgotha. Jesus was crucified for you and me. There was no death worse than a crucifixion. In fact, one early Roman writer said that suicide was preferable to crucifixion. It was just the most horrific kind of death. And that is the death that Jesus experienced for you and me. I think it's important that we really understand what Jesus endured, especially in a day when people use the cross as earrings and jewelry, and we put beautiful crosses on top of our churches, and all of that is fine. But in a certain way, it's deluded us. We've lost the meaning of the cross. The cross was not beautiful. The cross was ghastly. It was a horrific event for Jesus. And today, I'm gonna to talk to you about the act of crucifixion and what Jesus endured for you and for me. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to the program. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about the act of crucifixion. We're nearly at Easter, and I think it's good for us to reflect on what Jesus went through for you and for me. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the act of crucifixion. Then this week we're gonna be talking about Jesus' burial and his resurrection. But I wanna remind you that I'm speaking to you from my series called Unknown Facts About the Death, Burial, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. I love this series. It's based on these programs, but it comes with a study guide that is amazing. It's filled with all the Greek words, the definitions, the points, the principles, so much about Roman law and Jewish culture. It is just tremendous for you to grow personally to study. Or if you're discipling somebody, this would be a great tool to use. Or if you're in a Bible study group, it would be super for you to have, especially right now as we're considering the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The back of the series says, a revolutionary look at the story you thought you knew. Wow. The events of Christ's last days and hours revealed. It is just amazing. And I want to encourage you to order it. I'm also speaking to you from my book, which is called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. And I really tell you gladly, joyfully, that I love this book. The reason I love it is because writing this book affected me. If it affected me, I know it's going to affect you. What is in this book is simply amazing. The facts, the details, the insights about the defining moments of Christ's passion. And today I'm gonna to be reading you a lot from this book because I cannot improve on what I wrote. So forgive me for reading, but that's what I'm gonna do today. And I want you to listen very carefully as I describe the act of crucifixion. But today we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 26. And in verse 26, the Bible is describing Pilate and it says, and when he had scourged Jesus, he then delivered him to be crucified. In the last program, we looked at what it meant to be scourged. If you didn't hear that program, please go to the archives and listen to it. Jesus was scourged for your healing. The Bible says, by his stripes, you are healed. That word stripes in Greek is the word molops. It describes a full body bruise, a body totally discolored, completely swollen because it's been so abused. Jesus didn't just have a few little stripes across his body like most people imagine. His body was literally torn open 
by the whip of torturers who lacerated his body until Jesus began to bleed like an open hydrant. It is amazing what Jesus went through to purchase healing for you and healing for me. It's one reason why we shouldn't tolerate sickness in our life. Jesus didn't go through all of that so we would tolerate sickness. Jesus went through that to purchase healing and wholeness for you and for me. But that's not all. Matthew 27 verse 26 says, After Jesus was scourged, Pilate delivered him to be crucified. And that's what we're going to be dealing with today, the act of crucifixion. You know, today, people wear the cross in their ears. They wear it around their necks. We put it on the top of churches. And it's such a beautiful item to us. And in a certain way, this has dulled our awareness to how horrific the cross really was. The cross was not beautiful. The cross was not encrusted with diamonds or jewels. The cross was not made out of gold. The cross was an appalling, ghastly, horrible event. Horrible. And I want you to understand what it meant to be crucified. So today I'm going to read to you from my book, Paid in Full. The word crucified is from the Greek word staros, which describes an upright, pointed stake that was used for the punishment of criminals. Only criminals were crucified. So Jesus died the death of a criminal. This word was used to describe those who were hung up, impaled, or beheaded, and then publicly displayed. It was always used in connection with public execution, and the purpose of crucifixion was to humiliate the person that was being crucified. Crucifixion was one of the cruelest and most barbaric forms of punishment in the ancient world. Flavius Josephus described crucifixion as the most wretched of all deaths. It was viewed with such horror that in one of Seneca's letters, Seneca wrote that suicide was preferable to crucifixion. That's how horrible crucifixion was. At the time that Jesus was crucified, the act of crucifixion was entirely in the hands of Roman authorities. This punishment was reserved for the most serious offenders, usually for those who had committed some kind of treason or who had participated in or sponsored state terrorism. But once the offender reached the place where the crucifixion was to occur, he was laid on the cross beam that he carried. That's exactly what Jesus did. With his arms outstretched, then a soldier would drive a five-inch iron nail through each of his wrists, not the palm of his hands, but through his wrists, into the crossbeam. After being nailed to the crossbeam, the victim was hoisted by a rope, and the crossbeam was dropped into a notch on the top of the upright post. When the crossbeam dropped into the groove, the victim suffered excruciating pain as his hands and wrists wrenched by the sudden jerking motion. Then the weight of the victim's body caused his arms to be pulled out of their sockets. Josephus writes that the Roman soldiers, out of rage and hatred, amused themselves by nailing prisoners in different postures. Crucifixion was simply a vicious ordeal. It was just vicious. It was horrible what Roman soldiers did to people that they crucified. Once the victim's wrists were secured in place on the crossbeam, the feet came next. The victim's legs would be positioned so that the feet were pointed downward with the soles pressed against the post on which the victim was suspended. A long nail would then be driven between the bones of the feet, lodged firmly enough between those bones to prevent it from tearing through the feet as the victim arched upward, gasping for breath. In order for the victim to breathe, he had to push himself up by the feet, which were nailed to the vertical beam. Because the pressure on his feet became unbearable, it wasn't possible to remain in that position for very long, so eventually he would collapse back into the hanging position. So the victim who was crucified to breathe would push up and would collapse, would push up and would collapse. Couldn't stay up for long because the pressure and the pain was so terrible in the feet. As the victim pushed up and collapsed back down again and again over a long period of time, his shoulders eventually dislocated and popped out of joint. Soon the out-of-joint shoulders were followed by the elbows and wrists. 
the various dislocations caused the arms to be extended up to nine inches longer than usual, usually resulting in terrible cramps in the victim's arm muscles and making it impossible for him to push himself up any longer to breathe. When he was finally too exhausted and could no longer push himself up on the nail lodged in his feet, the process of asphyxiation began. Do you hear how horrible this is? Now just imagine today we wear crosses encrusted with diamonds. We love the cross. We've decorated it. We've made it beautiful. But you see how it's dulled our senses to the reality of the cross? The cross was horrible. For example, when Jesus said to the apostles, if any man wants to follow me, let him pick up his cross and follow me. That was a horrific thing to say. It was the equivalent of saying, be stripped naked, be crucified, be abused, pick up your cross and follow me. The whole idea of a cross in the ancient world was just a horrible idea. No one wanted crucifixion or a cross. But Jesus experienced all of this torture. When he dropped down with the full weight of his body on the nails that were driven through his wrists, it sent horrific pain up his arms to register in his brain. Added to this torture was the agony caused by the constant grating of his back that had just been scourged which was grating against the upright post every time he pushed up to breathe and then collapsed back into a hanging position. Remember, Jesus had just been scourged. His back had been ripped open. Now Jesus is crucified to our very rough beam. And every time he pushes up and falls down and pushes up and falls down, his back is grating across that very rough beam. This must have been terrifically painful. Due to the extreme loss of blood and hyperventilation, a victim would begin to experience severe dehydration. We can see this in Jesus' own crucifixion when he cried out in John 19, 28 and said, I thirst. After several hours of this torment, the victim's heart would begin to fail. Next, his lungs would collapse and the excess fluid would begin filling the lining of his heart and lungs, adding to the slow process of asphyxiation. A person that was crucified eventually drowned to death in his own fluids, which filled his lungs. When the Roman soldier came to determine whether or not Jesus was alive or dead, he thrust his spear into Jesus' side. One expert pointed out that if Jesus had been alive when the soldier did this, the soldier would have heard a loud sucking sound caused by air being inhaled past the freshly made wound in the chest. But the Bible tells us that water and blood mixed together came pouring forth from the wound the spear had made in Jesus' side, which was evidence that Jesus' heart and lungs had shut down and were now filled with fluid. It was enough to assure the soldier that Jesus was already dead. It was customary for Roman soldiers to break the lower leg bones of a person being crucified to make it impossible for the victim to push himself upward to breathe and thus causing him to asphyxiate at a much quicker rate. However, because of the blood and the water that gushed from Jesus' side, he was already considered dead, so there was no reason for the soldier to hasten Jesus' death by breaking his legs, so his legs were never broken. This is a brief taste a Roman crucifixion. And what I'm reading to you is a very light version of what really took place. It was simply horrific. Now just imagine Jesus has already been scourged. This is unthinkable. The Son of God would endure all of this. Jesus has already been scourged. His body has been laid open by two men who whipped him with a weapon. And at the end of those straps of leather were pieces of bone, metal, wire, glass, just shredded his body, shredded his body. The soldiers after that thrust a crown of thorns on his head. We saw that that word thorns is a Greek word which describes thorns so sharp they could cause delirium or even death. And when they shoved it on his head, those thorns scraped across Jesus' skull. Blood was pouring from Jesus' head. His hair was matted with blood, his beard, his mustache, his entire face covered with blood, and now Jesus is crucified in the most horrific manner by Roman soldiers who enjoyed this process of torture. This description of crucifixion was exactly what Jesus experienced on the cross when he died for you and for me. Wow.
This is why Paul later wrote in Philippians 2.8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even, even the death of the cross. That word even in Greek is very important. The Greek emphasis is on the word even from the Greek word day, which dramatizes the point that Jesus lowered himself to such an extent that he died even the death of the cross. It was the most horrific death in the entire ancient world. Nothing worse than this. Again, Seneca said suicide was preferable to crucifixion. The soldiers near the foot of the cross, according to Matthew 27, verse 35, parted his garments and cast lots for them. They didn't understand the great price of redemption that was being paid at that moment as Jesus hung asphyxiating to death, his lungs filling with fluid so that he couldn't breathe. But according to Roman custom, the soldiers who carried out the crucifixion had a right to the victim's clothes. Jewish law required that the person being crucified would be stripped naked. So when Jesus was crucified, he was completely stripped naked. This was a part of the humiliating act of crucifixion. So there Jesus hung completely opened and naked before the world while his crucifiers literally distributed his clothes among themselves. It is simply remarkable that all of this was taking place as Jesus was pushing down on the huge nail lodged in his feet so he could gasp for a breath before sagging back down into a hanging position. As Jesus' strength continued to drain away and the full consequences of man's sin was being realized in him, the soldiers at the foot of the cross played a game to see who would get his best piece of clothing. Matthew 27, verse 36 says, And sitting down, they watched him there. That is amazing to me. Jesus has been put through physical agony, and he is bearing in his body the sin of the human race. And the soldiers are casting lots for his clothes. They're playing games. And the Bible says they sat down, and they watched him there. No comprehension of what was taking place. The Greek word for watch is the Greek word terea, which means to guard. The Greek tense means to consistently guard or to consistently be on the watch. It was the responsibility of these soldiers to keep things in order, to keep watch over the crucifixion site, and to make sure no one came to rescue Jesus from the cross. So as they cast lots and played games, the soldiers were also keeping watch out of the corners of their eyes to make certain no one touched Jesus as he hung dying on the cross. When I read about the crucifixion of Jesus, it makes me want to repent for the callousness with which the world looks upon the cross today. In our society, the cross has become a fashion item, decorated with gems, rhinestones, gold and silver. Beautiful crosses of jewelry adorn women's ears and dangle at the bottom of gold chains and necklaces. The symbol of the cross is even tattooed on people's flesh. The reason this is so disturbing to me is that in beautifying the cross to make it pleasing to look upon, people have forgotten it wasn't beautiful or lavishly decorated at all. The, shock of Je the cross of Jesus was shocking and appalling. Jesus' totally naked body was flaunted in humiliation before a watching world. His flesh was ripped to shreds. His body was bruised from head to toe. He had to heave his body upward for every breath he breathed, and his nervous system sent constant signals of excruciating pain to his brain. Blood drenched Jesus' face and streamed down from his hands, his feet, and from the countless cuts and gaping wounds the scourging had left upon his body. In reality, the cross of Jesus Christ was a disgusting, repulsive, nauseating, stomach-turning sight, so entirely different from the attractive crosses that people wear today as jewelry or even as a part of their attire. Whether it's the Easter season or any other season of the year, it's good for all of us as believers to take a little time to remember what the cross of Jesus Christ was really like. If we don't deliberately choose to meditate on what he went through, we will never fully appreciate the price that he paid for us. How tragic if we lose sight of the pain and the price that he paid for our redemption. When we fail to remember what it cost Jesus to save us, 
please listen to this. This is so true. When you just take it for granted, you don't think much about it. When we fail to remember what it cost Jesus to save us, we tend to, te uh, we trend, tend to treat our salvation cheaply and even with disregard, we fail to appreciate it. That's why the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. All of that is in this book paid in full where I describe what Jesus went through on the cross for you and for me. Now, I know I've read a lot to you, but I hope you really listened. This is the price that Jesus paid. Now, that was the physical price. That was the emotional price, the mental price. But in addition to all of that, Jesus bore in himself the sin of the human race. That was the most terrifically horrible part of it all, that Jesus literally became sin. That's what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that he became sin for us. He didn't just taste it, but in the cross, Jesus realized in himself the sin of the entire human race. That was a weight heavier than the scourging, a weight heavier than the cross itself. But Jesus did all of that for you, for you. He did it for me. That's what Easter is about. It's not about bunnies and Easter eggs. It's about the cross. It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the very center of our faith. And we need to understand the cross, embrace the cross, and thank God for the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if you've learned anything from today's program. I hope that you have. I hope you've seen that the cross was a horrific, horrific event. So horrific that when Paul wrote about it in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, he said, Jesus humbled himself even to the death of a cross, the Greek word day, even, can you imagine it? He humbled himself even to the death of the cross. Nothing more debasing, nothing more humiliating. Jesus went from the very highest place to the very lowest place, and he did it to purchase our redemption. I want you to think about people you know that are unsaved. According to the Bible, if they die in sin, they go to hell. Jesus paid the price so they can avoid that. What are you going to do at this season of the year to tell somebody else about what Jesus did to set them free? We have a responsibility to share the good news that Jesus paid the price of redemption for all of us. That's what I want you to think about today. I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. From the courtyard of Pilate to the hill of Calvary, every step Jesus took on that Good Friday, he had you in mind. The Bible says Jesus died so our debt could be paid in full. In his book, Paid in Full, Rick Renner guides you through the details of Jesus' final hours on earth. In Paid in Full, you'll discover that this striking narrative of love and redemption is much more than the story taught in Sunday school. This powerful book can be yours for just $17. When you call or go online today, you can also get unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $40, you can discover the power of the cross and the plan to forgive mankind of sin like never before. Don't miss this special offer, paid in full, and unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Call now or go to renner.org. Today I've been talking to you about the process of crucifixion and I have in my hand a replica of the very kind of nails that were used to crucify Jesus to the cross. This is the kind of nail that was driven through Jesus' wrists and through the bones in his feet. Can you imagine this nail being driven through your wrists and through your feet, that's what happened to Jesus. And those nails held him in place as he died on the cross as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of you and me.
Jesus did that for you and for me. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 that Jesus was lifted up as the eternal Lamb of God, and there he died for you and for me, and he has the power to save anybody that will come to him today. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that we are not redeemed with gold and silver and carnal things, but with the precious blood of Christ himself. Amazing. Well, I'm speaking to you from my series called Unknown Facts About the Death, Burial, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is just loaded with information about all of these events. I want you to order this series. I believe it will really make a difference in your spiritual life. And I'm also speaking to you from my book called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. Every page of this book is precious. It's just filled with information that will take you somewhere new in your spiritual life. I really believe that. But let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. We thank you that blood cleanses our conscience so we're free of sin. We thank you for people we know that need to be saved, that that blood was shed for them. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to help us share the good news of Jesus Christ with the people we know who need to come to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's word release its power in your life today. It really will change your life. And I'll see you in the next program. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life. Amen. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with us, would you please let us know by going to renner.org forward slash salvation. We would love to connect with you. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.